Hi, this is Wale. My name is Wale Oluwade. I will be talking today or teaching today about He loves you. Jesus loves you. God loves you. The scripture says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of the scarcest virtues to find on this earth in this age is true or genuine love. I mean agape or divine love. I mean agape or divine love. One of the, one of the important virtues to find, one of the scarcest virtues to find on this earth is agape love, the love of God. It is the, one of the most difficult virtues to find. I mean even in the church, that is among fellow believers, love, the love of God is terribly lacking. By the, but this isn't new. Even in the days of Jesus, it was like that. The love of God, genuine love, true love. Because men or women will tell you, I love you, I love you. But when the chips are down, then you'll find out it was only lip service. It never went. Every profession of love did not go beyond their lips. I will share three different encounters in scripture to confirm this teaching. It, that even in the, day of, in the days of Jesus, it was always like that. Even in the, in the days before Jesus, it has always been like that. The first encounter I will share is found in the book of John chapter 5, from verse, verses 5 to 17. It says, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was killed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. I mean, imagine. Somebody for 38 years laid at this so-called pool of Bethesda. 38 years he was in that condition. He could not help himself. He was helpless. He was sick. He was afflicted. And this affliction had lasted for 38 years. Then he had an encounter with Jesus who set him free. And all the church leaders could say to this man was, it is not lawful for you to be cured on the Sabbath. Why did you get up? And then the man answered them and said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Can you see human beings and wickedness? Now, in verse 2 of this scripture, we are told there, there were a multitude of, of sick people with diverse sicknesses and diseases and in that same pool of Bethesda. You would at least expect the church leaders, the Jews, the Pharisees, you would expect them to plead with Jesus to heal this also. Because the same power in Jesus Christ that healed this man was available to heal all the other sick people. But no, because even the solitary beneficiary of Jesus' mercy and compassion was under vicious attack. Sadly, as it was then, so it is now. In Luke 13, I mean, let me, let me give you another example. In Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17, we see our second encounter between a woman who was physically sick and the church leadership again. This woman had a spirit of infirmity and was bent over for 18 years. And this had continued until she met Jesus, who then set her free. However, you would expect the, 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 the city people the church leadership to be happy and thankful for this great deliverance of one of their members. But no, they were offended that Jesus again 
performed this deliverance on the Sabbath, as far as they cared, the law was more important than the life and the awful situation of this lady. They couldn't care less about her life, her health. The awful condition she had endured for 18 years, they couldn't, they couldn't be bothered. Rather, they were indignant and would rather she remain in a deplorable situation. Meanwhile, these same people, Sabbath or not, whether it was Sabbath or not, each of these accusers will lose their donkeys and horses and asses and take this to drink water and graze. Now, that means they valued their animal more than a human being. <laughs> Imagine that. These same hypocrites will lose their own donkeys and asses and, 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 and horses and take them to graze on the Sabbath. But this one, for, for all they cared, she, could, she should remain in a deplorable condition. That is, that is human beings for you. Now, the third and the last example is another encounter with Jesus in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 34. Here we see the case of the man who was born blind and who had sat and begged all his life. He had, he had, because of his blindness, he had been a beggar all his life. By reason of his condition, the general consensus among his church leadership was that his parents had sinned and that was the reason for his deformity. Imagine, imagine how the parents must have felt all these years to have to live with the social stigma. Imagine also the untold ridicule, the mockery, the scorn, and the derision of neighbors and peers of this man all through his life. I could imagine the tongues and the physical mockeries of his schoolmates and, and neighbors. Even the disciples of Jesus knew of and believed this false narrative that the parents of this man had sinned and that's why he was born blind. Even the disciples of Jesus believed, believed the lie. Jesus had to deal with this error first amongst his own disciples. He corrected that foolishness that no, nobody sinned. Thereafter, he performed a great miracle in such a simple manner whereby this blind man got brand new eyes. Then all hell practically broke loose. I mean, literally, all hell broke loose after this man was cured of his blindness. A few rejoiced with him, just a few, just a handful. Many doubted that he was the one that he was even sick in the first place. Many more criticized Jesus for performing the miracle again on the Sabbath. Now, one of the things you would have to learn to deal with in this life is the anger, the hatred, the bitterness, envy, and jealousy of relatives loved ones, and friends when you are blessed. Whether you like it or not, and I'll tell you anyway, not many want you delivered from your challenges and problems. Hmm. Many wonder why you are still alive and not dead. Many of your so-called loved ones or inner circle actually wish your problems and challenges will consume and drown you. Many of the people you are confiding in are busy running to for help, for whatever, many of them pray and wish your problems multiply and get worse. Therefore, to look to a man, to a human being, for love and compassion is one of the most dangerous things you could ever do. Except for the ones chosen and sent to you by God himself. If you depend on man, your dependency on man will kill you faster than your challenges. I will say that again. Except those that God chooses himself and send them to you to bless you. If, you. if you on your own begin to go around looking for man to depend on, that will kill you faster than whatever problems you think you have. Imagine this man's predicament. He found himself in a situation he didn't create and it wasn't his fault. Yet, he had to suffer incalculable reproach and humiliation from neighbors and his church folks. And even after help came to him, instead of them to rejoice with him, it was more scorn and problems. But I come today to tell you, God loves you. This teaching is about the love of God. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And God demonstrated this great love by giving his only son, Jesus, to die for you and for me. We stated that in John 3.16. How many of you listening or watching can sacrifice your only son or daughter for your friend, let alone a stranger because that is what God did how many of you I would ask you again how many of you listening and watching can sacrifice your, your only son or daughter for either your friends not stock of strangers but that's exactly was what Jesus was, was what God did 
Jesus himself also loves us and demonstrated this great love by voluntarily dying on the cross for your sake and my sake. Jesus stated very clearly in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, not any other way, by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How did Jesus show us this great love? Look at John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Do you see this? Can you hear this profound statement? God loves us. We saw that in John 3, 16. Jesus demonstrated his love. He said, by this all we know, they are my disciples, if you love one another. And he, he loved us. Because he said, greater love has no one than this. There is no greater love than this, than for you to lay down your life for your friends. And that is metaphorically speaking. But Jesus, when, when Jesus did that, he, he paid the ultimate sacrifice. It was not metaphor. Jesus actually died on the cross for you and for me. Don't ever say you love someone when you are not willing and ready to sacrifice all for them. Don't ever say you love someone when you're not willing and ready to sacrifice whatever you have with them. You have money and your brother or your sister have a need and you're not willing to share. You don't love them. You have an accommodation. Someone needs an accommodation. You're not ready to take them in. You don't love them. Now, I am saying to you, come to God and come to Jesus. What is the, what is the message? Come to God and come to Jesus. All those you look to may have failed you. But God never fails. How do I know that God never fails? Well, well, God has never failed me. I may not have all I have asked, trusted and believed God for. Yet I know that God, I stand with Abraham to judge God faithful. Everything he promised to do, I know God will do. This teaching is a proof of that. One of the many examples of what I know God will do for me. For over 15 years, Satan told me, that it was over, that I will not teach or preach the gospel anymore. But God kept telling me, don't worry, Wally, I will make you teach the whole world. Now, two months ago, I wasn't even thinking about this. Yet, here I am. Why? Because God is faithful. God never fails. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions does not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Your parents, siblings, and spouse may have disappointed you, but God won't and can't disappoint you. All your friends may have failed you, but God cannot fail you. Listen to David, a man greatly acquainted with rejection. Look at what David said in Psalm 27 verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. That was David, a man who was very acquainted with disappointment. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, this is what God says. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Meaning, don't envy anybody what they have. Be content with such things as you have. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For he himself has said, that is God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has promised you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God loves you with an everlasting love. Come to God. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. I don't know much, but I know that man will fail you when you least expect. A man or woman can profess love to you in the morning and in that same day, in the afternoon of that same day, demonstrate pure hatred that will make even Satan green with envy. I will say that again. The men and women you are putting your trust in, they will tell you they love you, they love you, they love you. In the morning, they will tell you they love you. In the afternoon of the same day, they will show you pure hatred that even the devil will be envious of them. Why? It is in the nature of a natural or carnal man to behave like that. Why? Because the best of men, at their very best, are after all still human beings. The Bible says about man, 
Listen to this carefully. What the Bible says about a man or men generally. Psalm 62 verse 9. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. Now, if you weigh both of them on the scales, they are all together lighter than vapor. Imagine. Men of low degree, men of high degree, they are all together lighter than vapor. The Bible says again in Jeremiah 17 verse 5, still talking about man. He says, cursed. Anybody is, every, anyone is cursed who trusts in another man. The man is cursed who trusts in another man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. Put your trust absolutely only in the Almighty God. Why? I will tell you why. You should put your trust only in the Almighty God because He loves you with an everlasting love. Psalms 125 verse 1 says, Those who trust in the Lord, they are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds those who trust Him, the people that trust in Him, from this time forth and forevermore. If you put your trust in God, you cannot be moved, no matter what comes against you, no matter what challenges or situations of life come against you, you will remain. Because only God is ever reliable, dependable, and faithful. God doesn't change his mind or opinion on you. I hope you know that. Oh, you better know God. And I will say that again. You better know God. Oh, I will say that again one more time. You better know God. However, because if you don't know God, if all you know is one big man or one big woman, you will be disappointed. And like the Bible says, I joined the Bible to say, what a miserable human being you are. Because I told you, once again, the best of men at their best are still just men. However, there is only one condition you need to meet to enjoy this great love of God. He says that they that trust in the Lord, they are immovable like Mount Zion. But there is a condition you need to meet, only one. What is that condition? Jesus said in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and and we will come to him and make our own with him. Did you hear that? If anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Then my father will love him. We will come to him and we will come to and make our home. Do you love God? That is the question. Because if you love God, you will love his word. You will keep his word. Do you love God? That is the condition. Do you love God? Because God loves you. Jesus loves you. But do you love him? And you demonstrate that love for God and Jesus by studying, by doing his word. Now, God himself spoke. Jesus spoke about God himself spoke in, in Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me. Do you hear that? I love those who love me. The only people God is guaranteed to, is, is guaranteed to love are those who love him. He says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently will find me. How do you show you love God? By spending quality time daily in the study and meditation of his word. Do you spend quality time with God daily? Have you read and studied your Bible today? Have you prayed today? How many minutes or hours did you spend doing this? Oh, you need to see me sit down. I can sit down just reading the Bible for five, six, seven, eight hours. And I tell you the truth in the presence of God this afternoon. You need to see me. See, there is time stand still when I'm in the presence of God. I am not in a rush to go anywhere. I, the, one of the best moments of my life is spent just studying the Bible. I could be on a verse and I'll be checking the concordance on my iPhone, checking this, comparing with different scriptures to get deeper, deeper understanding, to get clarity, to get a rhema, to run with in the race of life. How can you claim you love God when you hardly know any scripture, but rather you know all the latest music, you know all the latest dance, and you know, you know all the latest slangs? You don't have time for God, but you have time for parties. 
from one party to the other. Everything they bring to your office, they are buying this. Somebody is going to to Ojakuta for, for marriage. You buy the material, you go. Somebody is going to Otupo, you go there. Somebody is going to Olomaboro, you go there. Somebody is going to the east, you follow them. You have time for parties. You have time to go to the cinema. You have time for gossip. You have time for TV series. Telumundo and, 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 and all this stuff. You have time. You don't have time for God, but you have time for football and even sports betting. But you don't have time for God. You don't have time for the word and prayer, but you have time for your career because you believe you are safe in your career. Now, let me tell you, has the coronavirus not shown that nobody is safe except those kept by God? This coronavirus, COVID-19, ravaging the entire world now. It has leveled and humbled Donald Trump, America, Japan, UK, Canada. Everybody is humbled. Nobody is safe except those kept by God. Haven't you seen or heard that many great and powerful men and women are victims of this evil virus? The Prime Minister's wife of Canada is struck down. The Minister for Health in the UK is struck down by coronavirus. In Iran, most of their higher high, high echelon are struck down by coronavirus. And the list goes on. In Brazil, the same thing. You don't have time, but you have time for politics and social networking. Every social gathering, they know you are a socialite. But I tell you, you better know God. The only people God is guaranteed to reveal himself to, when they need help, desperately, are those who love him and God knows them. God cannot be deceived. Going to church isn't the same with genuine love for God. You can deceive your pastor, your geo, your pope, your bishop, but God cannot be deceived. They may give you deaconess and deacon and apostle and uh, they gave you all kinds of titles, but God is not mocked. Knowing pastors isn't the same as loving God. All this mommy and daddy nonsense doesn't move God. Oh, if I didn't commit as a young man to seek and put all my hopes and trust in God, I can tell you confidently, I wouldn't be here teaching you now. I learned as a young man that men are unreliable. And then I discovered from scripture that God is ready with open arms to love me without reproach. So, like Bishop Oedekpo will say, settle down and develop a great walk with God. Settle down and develop a great relationship with the Almighty God. The challenges of life don't give notice. That's why you develop a healthy relationship with God before they come. That great old hymn says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. God loves you, and Jesus loves you. Seek God. Love him. Love his word. And God will demonstrate his love, his undying love to you. Till I come your way again, stay blessed.